Welcome. My name is Father Joseph Gill, and I'm glad you joined us on Finding Life as we dive deeper into our faith to find the life that God has planned for you and I. You know, around the middle of the 1900s, there was a famous scientist who wrote a sentence that's rather arresting. He said, How can we believe in God if all we need to do is flick on a light switch and light comes out? And that's a valid question. Because we have so many advances in science, does that mean that faith is completely irrelevant? What is that relationship between science and faith? I remember a few、uh, years ago, I was running a youth group and a mom came up to me and she was very concerned about her son. She said, You know, my son used to want to become a priest and now he's 16 though and he says he's an atheist. And I said, Really? Well, why is he an atheist? And she said, Well, you know, he started to learn about evolution in school and all of a sudden he realized that the, the entire Bible is just a myth. But is that true? Is the entire Bible just a myth? Is everything, has science made faith completely irrelevant? Well, let's dive deeper and、uh, start to examine that issue. So, science and faith have two different objects because the role of science is to deal with the material world, with things that we can taste and touch and sense and measure. Really, if you think about it, the scientific method is all about experimentation. And experimentation, by its very nature, means that you have to have something that you can measure. So, science's limits are this material world. But can science ever prove that there is no such thing as a spiritual reality? I don't think so, because that goes beyond the limits of what science has, is able to do. Science really has to remain silent on the issue of whether or not there's a spiritual reality, whether or not there's life after death, whether or not there is a God, because it's beyond the purview of science. You can't test someone to see if they have a soul. You can't measure how long eternity is. These things go beyond science. And this is where faith comes in. Because faith is based upon revelation. Faith is, ba- faith is based upon what God has revealed about Himself. So we, there are some things that we can know about God simply on the level of human reason. For example, we can know that God exists. One of、uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' fav-、uh, famous arguments for the existence of God is that God is the uncaused cause. So, for example, we look around in the universe and we notice that everything that exists was made by something else. We see a tree, but that tree came from a seed and that seed came from another tree. We look around and we see a light bulb and we, we don't think that the light bulb just randomly occurred. We know that the light bulb came from a light bulb factory and the glass was silicon or sand or whatever you know, they make it out of and the you know, filament was tungsten and all of that was put together by an intelligent person in order to make it. So if we look around at the universe and we see that everything was created by something else, then we know that there must be a cause behind it. We call that the uncaused cause. Now, some people may say, well, If there's an uncaused cause, like, you know, if God is the uncaused cause, then who caused God? But by the very definition of God as the uncaused cause, it means that no one could have created him because he is outside of time. He is what we call a necessary being instead of a contingent being. A contingent being means that a being owes its existence to something outside of itself. A necessary being means that it, it owes its existence to simply to the fact that it is. In fact, in Scripture, in, Genesis, or in Exodus 3 15, God reveals his name to Moses. And his name was I Am. That's hugely significant that God calls himself I Am. Not I was, not I will be, or not a, a, a name, but he calls himself I Am because he is existence itself. From him flows every, every, other, every other existence in the entire universe. So, that we can know from pure reason alone, that God exists. We can also know some other things about God simply from reason. We can look at the, per- the perfections that we see here in human nature and we can apply them to God. Now, there's two different kinds of perfections in philosophy. There's what we call mixed perfections, which are perfections that are based upon、uh, material things, such as if someone's fast, you say that's a mixed perfection because it's based upon.、Um, It's based upon spa-、uh, a spatial reality that a person can move from point A to point B very quickly. However, there are other perfections that we notice in human beings and in this world that we can say are not dependent upon this material world. For example, somebody is a good person. Mother Teresa is a good person, and we can compare that to you know, Adolf Hitler and say Adolf Hitler was not a good person. So if we see goodness as a perfection that Mother Teresa has, We can, by, by extension, we can apply that to God and say that God is infinite goodness. 
Or we can look at some work of art and we can say, that's beautiful. By extension, we can say, God must be then perfect beauty because beauty is not simply dependent upon a spatial, material, temporal reality. It's something that goes beyond that. So these are the things that we can know about God simply using human reason, that he exists, and we can know some of his perfections. But let's be honest, at the end of the day, those are two very limiting things to know because we can't have a real relationship with God if those are the only things that we know about him. So that's why God came and revealed himself to us. He revealed himself first through creation. Anytime we look around at creation, we see God's handiwork. We see how he's shaped it, how he's made it for a purpose, how he's made it beautiful. His fingerprints are all over the universe. But even more than that, he revealed himself through his word. First through the prophets. In the Old Testament, he revealed himself to Moses in a burning bush. He revealed himself to the prophets of Isaiah and, and Zechariah and all of these other Old Testament prophets. And then finally in the New Testament, the perfect revelation of God was Jesus Christ. Jesus is, in visible form, the incarnation of God. He is the face of God to this world. And so that's how we can get to know God, really, is through his revelation, where he reveals, for example, that he is a father, where he reveals his great love for all of creation, where he reveals the meaning of human life and the meaning of human existence, how we were destined for an eternity with him. These are things that we can't know simply on the basis of reason alone. But wait a second, is faith then irrational because it goes beyond reason? No, it's not irrational, it's super rational. It goes above and beyond reason. But now this is where faith becomes very challenging because faith is both a gift and a choice. It's a gift. It's one of the three theological virtues. In other words, it's a gift that God gives to people so that they can believe in him. However, it is also a choice. We have to choose to respond to that gift of faith and say, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you exist. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are good. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are my heavenly father. So faith is both a gift and a choice. It's not unreasonable, but super reasonable, above and beyond reason. So let's, let's take a look then on a deeper level at the differences then between scientific truth and religious truth. Because both of these really are two sides of the same coin. They're looking at the reality of human existence, the reality of the world, but looking at it from different perspectives. Because science looks at how things came to be. People often ask the question, well, why was there lightning? Well, then they go and study it and they discover all about electrons and, and how the clouds interact with the earth. So if science, the role of science then is to look at how things exist. Why do things, why are things the way they are? Religious truth, however, looks at ultimate meaning. It looks at the universe and says, okay, well, now we know why lightning exists. You know, we know the scientific reason behind it, but let's look at human beings. Do we have a spiritual side? Are we made just for this world or are we made for something deeper? What is that longing, that ache that we have in the human heart? Can we have a relationship with God? Those are the kind of truths that are looked at from the, the religious perspective. So science and faith look at the reality of the world in different ways. Science on the level of the material universe, faith on the level of the ultimate questions and of the spiritual universe. One reason why faith is sometimes a difficult gift to accept and a difficult choice to make is because of the difference between proof and evidence. In our faith, there's very few things that we can prove without a shadow of a doubt, but pretty much everything has a lot of evidence behind it. Again, our faith is not irrational, but super rational. Let me give you a, a practical real world example of the difference between proof and evidence. So can we actually prove that smoking causes cancer? We really can't, because if we could prove it, that meant that 100% of the time, every single person who ever smoked would have cancer. But that's obviously not the case. Or for another example, can you prove that Julius Caesar actually existed? I mean, none of us can. None of us were able to go back in a time machine and actually meet him. It could, in theory, be an elaborate hoax. However, we look at the evidence for the existence of Julius Caesar, and we see that there are things written about him. And heck, even, even Shakespeare wrote a play about him. So there's enough evidence to say that, okay, I'm willing to believe that Julius Caesar really did exist. Same way with smoking and causing cancer. It may not be a 100% uh, 
uh, rate of cancer for everyone who smokes, but there's enough of a link, there's enough of a scientific evidence that I can say, all right, I'm willing to believe that on the basis of the evidence. It's the same way with our faith. Our faith, a lot of the, th the aspects of our faith are not provable. For example, Jesus rose from the dead. That's kind of the cornerstone of Christian religion as it is. But can we actually prove beyond a shadow of the doubt that Jesus rose from the dead? No, we can't. We can't prove it. However, there's plenty of evidence that supports it and I think makes a convincing case. So for example, some evidence that supports the resurrection is the fact that the tomb is empty. You go to the tomb and no one has ever claimed to really have Jesus' body. Another reason is because Roman soldiers knew what they were doing and they stationed several troops of guards outside of the tomb in order to defend it against the body being stolen. Besides, where were the apostles when Jesus died, was crucified? They weren't, you know, bold followers going all the way to the cross. They were wimpy men who were in the upper room terrified that that same fate may reach them as well. So with all of this evidence kind of pointing to the resurrection, it makes me say, all right, I'm willing to take that leap of faith and say, yes, I do believe it. It may not be 100% foolproof, but I, I recognize that there's enough evidence to make a rational case for the faith. Now, the question remains though, is the church anti-science? Because sometimes this tough balance between science and faith seem to contradict. They seem to kind of crash into one another, especially when you talk about things like embryonic stem cell research. When the church says, no, you can't do that, and science says, but it holds so much potential for potential healings. So how do we make that balance? Well, simply because science says we can do it, doesn't mean that we should do it. And remember, the church is looking at different questions than science is looking at. Science is looking at whether or not it's possible to make an embryonic stem cell line. However, the church is looking at what is the meaning and the dignity of the human person? Is a human person truly there when they're just one cell big? And the church says, yes, when you're one cell, you're an individual who has a soul, who is immortal and made in the image and likeness of God, and therefore must be treated with all the rights and dignity accorded to fully grown human beings. So even though science says, yes, we can do it, religion says, wait a second, should we do it? Is this really in the best interest of humanity? Now, I know a lot of times science kind of takes a poll and says, you know, who thinks we should do it? And enough, if enough scientists write, raise their hand, they go on with the experiment or with the, you know, the technique that they're doing. However, truth is not known uh, always by democratic vote. A lot of times truth comes from revelation or from reading or from, um, from the, yeah. a lot of times truth comes from revelation or from reason. And so if we look at those two aspects of the truth, especially considering that we believe that the Catholic church has the Holy Spirit, which can guide it into all truth, then when the church says, whoa, maybe we shouldn't go forward on this path of science, hopefully, hopefully science will have the wisdom to recognize that the church is trying to act in humanity's best interests. One area in which science and faith often seem to crash is in the area of the creation of humanity, evolution. In fact, when I talk to high school teens, this is one of the biggest sticking points where they really struggle in their faith because they say, in the Bible, God created the world in seven days, but you know, evolution's telling me the world was created in 13 billion years. Which one is true? The answer is both of them. Both of them, how can they both be true? Well, because the, sci the Bible is not meant to be read as, as if it were an absolute science textbook. There is a great deal of actual history in the scriptures, but that doesn't mean that every word is actually historically true. And there are many different genres in the scripture, because we have to remember the Bible is not just one book. It's actually a collection of over 70 books that were written by a, a wide variety of people over the course of several millennia. So in the Old Testament, we have a great deal of history, but we also have some stories that are of the genre of parable. And a parable is not a myth. And here's where a lot of people get really confused. When Jesus told parables, he wasn't just telling myths just to kind of pass on culture. Rather, a, a parable is a story meant to tell a profound truth about humanity. And I personally believe that the story of Adam and Eve is a parable. It's a story meant to tell profound truths about humanity. In fact, even John Paul II said that Catholics can believe in evolution because he says that evolution is more than a theory, quote. 
But how do we jive then if we're, if we're Catholics? How do we combine believing in evolution with believing in our Catholic faith? Well, what are the truths that this parable of Adam and Eve put forth? For, for example, one of the truth is that God created the universe. It didn't simply come about by random chance. Another truth is that human beings were created distinct from all the animals because we were made in the image and likeness of God. A third truth is that human beings fell. We were, we were not always perfect. And because of our fall, sin entered the world and from sin came division and hatred. And finally, another truth is that God did promise to intervene and that God often speaks to people, rose up prophets and, and covenants in the Old Testament, and then finally through Christ, raised up the church as the means of salvation in the world. What we read in the scriptures, the truths in this, this parable of Adam and Eve, shine a lot of light even on the theory of evolution. Because the theory of evolution basically says that human beings evolved from lower animals, which is fine. We can understand that as long as we understand that at some point God did insert a soul and created the human beings in his image and likeness. But there's some holes also in the evolutionary theory from a philosophical standpoint that can't be filled by anything other than faith. For example, evolutionary theory believes that animals, animals evolved from a lower form to a higher form over a, a many centuries and over many generations. But consider this example. Let's say a fish was going to grow legs and walk on land. Well, when it starts growing the legs by some sort of genetic mutation, the little leg sprouts would be sticking out. And this wouldn't be a fully formed leg, just a tiny little, little sprout. But wait a second, is that an evolutionary advantage or disadvantage? It would be an evolutionary disadvantage to have a tiny leg sprout on a fish. Why? Because then the fish couldn't swim as fast as it could if it didn't have the leg sprout. And because it's a disadvantage, that means because of natural selection, that animal necessarily would have died out. It would have been eaten. It would have fallen to the food chain. So in order for there to actually be evolution, there has to be what we call in theology, a teleology. In other words, there has to be an end purpose for which these random mutations happened. Random mutations are fine to believe in, but to believe that random mutations would happen so completely randomly without any intelligence designing it, for me, it's hard to believe. Consider, for example, the complexity of the human eye. Now, I'm no scientist, so I can't tell you all the scientific terms about the human eye, but consider that it's, a, it's a, a part of the body that allows light to come in, and the light then is picked up by rods and flipped upside down and sent to the brain where these impulses are turned into images within our minds. This is incredibly complicated and complex. Could something that complicated can, can cut could something that complicated have come simply by random chance? Of course not. There had to be an intelligence behind it to, to form it and to make it what it is today. It's much like this. If I were to take a bag of Scrabble letters, shake them up, and then dump them out on the table, do you think it would make a sentence? Probably not, because random chance really can't make something that's ordered. But when we see evolution, we see a pattern we see ev evolving from a lower animal to a higher animal. We see going up the food chain through evolution. And so if this order is present in evolution, then there must be some sort of intelligence in order to order it. So the church does not say that we can't believe in evolution. We can believe in evolution, but we have to believe in theistic evolution, in an evolution that's guided by an intelligent designer who knows what he's about. So, in the end run, is the church really against science? I don't believe so. The church has really been on the leading edge of science in many ways. For example, the person who came up with the Big Bang Theory was a Catholic priest. The man who worked a great deal on genetics, Gregor Mendel, was also a Catholic priest. It was the Catholic Church that started the university system, spreading knowledge. And even before that, it was the Catholic Church in the monasteries that after the Roman Empire, continued to keep learning and the arts and sciences alive and growing. So the Catholic Church is not anti-science. There's a wonderful story about an elderly gentleman who one time was taking the tram ride in London, England. And this elderly gentleman was silently praying the rosary as he was going along. And a man got on, a younger man, who upon seeing this, this man with his uh, beads going through his fingers, proceeded to talk to him about science and said, are you still going with that superstition of the rosary? 
Come on, no one's doing that nowadays. This is, this is the modern world. You have to get with it. Because nowadays, science is going to be our salvation. We don't need those old superstitious myths. And the man listened very patiently. And at the end of the tram ride, the man said, excuse me, I have to get off now, but I'd really like to continue this conversation. Could I give you my name and address where perhaps you could visit me sometime? And the younger man agreed. So the man wrote down his name on a sheet of paper and handed it to the younger man. And after he departed, the younger man took a look at the sheet of paper and saw the name written there was Blaise Pascal, one of the greatest scientists known to the history of the world, and also a man of deep religious faith. I'd like to conclude with a quote, something that I found to be quite profound. Werner Heisenberg was a German theoretical physicist and he was kind of the father of quantum mechanics. But he said, the first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist, but at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. Science and faith are really two sides of the same coin. Because if we're trying to seek truth, then we can seek truth in the material world through science and we can seek truth in the spiritual world through faith. The two of them are not opposed. Rather, they go together, but they have to recognize the limits of each other. Faith really allows science to kind of explore the natural world and find out kind of the, the meaning that God put into creation, while science has to respect that faith knows about the spiritual realm and about eternity and what's truly best for the human person. So when both faith and science respect each other, they go together very well and they lead us to the one truth, which is God himself.